Talk about diamonds. What the heck are you talking about? Okay, we have multiple in here. First of all, let's talk about multiple inheritance. We have multiple inheritance in C++. What does it mean? It means um, the hierarchy of inheritance is not just a, a chain of things coming out. When we have a reg when we the way we learned down to this point, if you have a derived class, you can always see who's the parent, and from that you see who's the parent, who's the parent, and keep going up, right? Now we can have a class that is built up of two classes and adds features, like you use fstream for. Like when you have fstream, fstream is made up of two classes and more. What are the two classes? iStream and OStream, correct? So if stream and of stream, and f stream is made up of those two, and that's why we have all the seek g and a seek p business over there. Why did they do that? Because if o stream, of stream, or o stream and i stream, they both had only a seek function. Then when it was getting inherited to f stream, and you said seek, you didn't know which seek is called. Okay, so you can f f feel the dilemma of, oh, tell P and tell G, because we want, for, for getting, I want to see where the location is, and for putting in a file, I want to see where the location is. Therefore, we have seek P and G. So it sounds, okay, so down to this point, there is no problem with this thing. Okay, so when you are actually dealing, first I'm going to tell you what, what am I trying to teach, then I'm going to bring the sample code. So when we have regular inheritance, type of a thing, when I say regular, I mean multiple, but regular. It, it means that you have, you have one class, and then you have another class, and out of these two classes, out of these two classes, you build a third one. So this class is the left one and the right one at the same time. Down to this point, everything is OK. And when we are dealing with shadowing uh, uh, overriding methods, we need to always remember that if your methods, the ones that you are using, are used many, many, many times, it's a good idea to name them differently as seek G and seek B that we have. We didn't need to do that, by the way. There was a way to call. And how do we actually call explicitly a parent's class when we a parent's when a, a, when a method of a parent is shadowed? How do we explicitly call it to make sure the derived one is not called? Yeah, scope resolution, right? So we put the so we could have done that. They could just call I stream seek seek and O stream seek seek, and then they could say uh, I stream scope resolution seek. So the seek of I stream would have been called an O stream scope resolution seek, and the O streams could have been called. But that's long, right? So and you know C programmers are lazy. You can know from the language, right? It's everything shorthanded. Okay, because of that, they say, oh, the heck with it. We're just going to uh, name it differently so we're not going to have conflict on these four functions. Okay. <sighs> so down to this point, everything is good. You have a way to distinguish which parent you're dealing with. Problem comes in when your design, your, this is a class design. This is not an object diagram. What is the difference between an object diagram and a class diagram? You, you all took system analysis, right? <laughs> what does that mean? Like, you took system analysis and design, right? Uh, so yeah, it, yeah, is it object-oriented design? It's no? I don't know which, at, which stage you're, yes. Uh-huh. Not sequence. I, I'm talking about object diagram. What is an object diagram? They don't do so we actually do just Ooh. Okay. A class diagram. This is a class diagram. That I'm, but this is not correct. 
A class diagram, I should do it now. Class diagram is when you click on a class thing, the class diagram in, in thing, and it creates a class diagram for you. An object, so my class diagram could be just one class, but an object diagram could be 50 instances of that. An object diagram is how the classes are instantiated in your program. You follow what I'm saying? So this essentially, the, the so when you are reading your use cases, okay, you know what the use case is. So when uh, they say all the names are classes, right? Yeah. Things that, anybody remembers that at all? Or I'm talking, forget about it. So when you're reading the use case, the use case identifies who the actors of this thing are. So you know what the actors are. You create classes for the actors. But how many instances are, of actors are in play in it? That's the object right? diagram. So you know that you have, hello, you, know, you know that you have a class called car. Okay? But when you are this for a use case for a parking. So you say, I have a vehicle, I have a car, I have a motorcycle, I have a bus, right? So this is your class diagram. But how many buses can you instantiate out of the bus class? That's your object diagram. Do we understand this? How many motorcycles can fit in a parking, slot, parking lot of yours? That's your object diagram. So what is the object diagram? The object diagram is how the classes are going to get instantiated in a thing. Now, so this is a, this, I pretend that this is the classes that I'm trying to represent. So sometimes, this class is inherited from a, another class and this one from another, right? This is perfectly good. There is still no problem, which means when I create an instance of the grandchild, I know it has a mother, it has a father, it has a grandmother, it has a grandfather, right? So I know what exists in a, in a grandchild in here. The, grand the grandchild class of mine has a mother, father, grandmother, and grandfather in it. Correct? But that's good if these two are inherited from different classes. What if these two are inherited from the same class? So, if you look at this diagram, I have a base class, and this part of my, I have a base class, and this part of my inheritance, just focus on this one, is a very simple inheritance, right? I have a base, I have a base class, and I derive something out of it. So, the code goes somewhere. So, you have a class, public, and you have the base class, right? Then, for the second part of the code, when you are implementing this one, this is the focus of our attention. Oh, actually, let me just do something that, it, that makes, it, makes it better. So, in here, let's call this one base. D1, so, so when I'm talking, we know what I'll be talking about. D2, and this one is the G, okay? So going back to what I was talking about one more time. When I'm talking about this, I have derived one publicly inherited from base, right? The code of drive one, only you see there's a base that is, okay. In this module, you will see another inheritance is happening. In this inheritance of yours, you have D2 public base, correct? We're all okay with that, right? In the module for G, what you see, in the module in G, what you see is... G 
public D1 comma public D2, which means my G is has the capability of D1 and D2. But question comes to mind, wait a minute, didn't D1 have a base in it? Yes. Didn't D2 have a base in it? Yes. So what does the object diagram looks like? Does the object diagram of this thing look like this? Or it looks like, I'm going to do the arrows too. Is the object diagram this? Or the object diagram looks like something like this. Oh, sometimes it's not very. OK, so what you see over here is this essentially. That's B, B. This is uh, D1. This is D1. This is D2. This is G. And this one is B, D1. D2 and G. So which one is the object diagram? What I mean is that if the constructor of D1 is setting B to 5, is setting B to 1, and the constructor of D2 is setting B to 2, do I have a base with a value 1 inside D1 and a base in a value with 2 in D2? Or somehow I have one B object that belongs to both D1 and D2. Which means when D1 sets it to 1, when D2 is setting to do, what's going to happen? That's a diamond that we have to either avoid or set it so it can be done properly. Now, if we, have, we can actually tell to the compiler how to do this. I want you to know what the conflict is. When you are doing a multi, uh, if you have only one level of inheritance with multiple inheritance, life is beautiful. There is nothing wrong with it. But if you have a grandparent over there, and the, ch the, the, the parents derive from the same grandparent, then you have the dilemma. Do I have the diamond or I don't have it? If you have diamond, then we're in trouble. If we don't have diamond, there's nothing to worry about. It's just inheritance with values. Okay, now, my question is, <coughs> what type of a constructor is common and everybody can, if, uh, if, if two classes are inheriting from the same class, which constructor guarantees that is identical for both? It's the default constructor, correct? To guarantee, that's the only way that you can guarantee. If a, cons a, a, a class has five different constructors, the one that you can make sure the signature and everything are exactly what you want is a default constructor. Nothing can go wrong with it, right? That's what it is. When you want to have a diamond diagram created for you, when you set it, set up your code, and you say, I want it to be a diamond, not that one. You, if you don't mention anything, that's what's going to get created. That's what it is. So if you just write the regular syntax for inheritance that you know, this is what's going to get created, which means when you say G, scope resolution D1 dot something, you know what is the value of here. When you say G, you cannot say scope resolution B. You can't do that. Because B is two of them, it gets confused. You have to say D scope resolution, B scope resolution. You have to tell which base you are dealing with. With a diamond, that's not the case. If you say G, you can directly go to B scope resolution because there is only one grandparent. 
Okay? You can enforce this. But, but, I want you to listen carefully. No matter how you request the inheritance, oh, there's no why. No matter how you, no matter how you define your inheritance, when I say define, I'm talking about this inheritance. Let's say this one. Let's say D1 is using the two argument constructor to set its base. Let's say D2 is using a three argument constructor to set its base. When you set a diamond, that's all down to garbage. No matter what you say, this will be defaulted. In a diamond, you cannot say, I want them both to use a single argument or constructor to do that. You can't. The construction must be common, something that does not need to be repeated. If you use a single argument constructor, the values of the arguments can be different between the two. So you don't know which one is right. The fault constructor is the only one that doesn't need anything. It means if D1 creates the B, D2 can use it with the same thing. That's why when you go the diamond, the grandparent is always defaulted. There is no other way. Yes. I didn't even mention how. I didn't mention how we do it. I'm going to teach you how to do it with the keyword virtual. But it's not the same thing as virtual for a function. That's why I didn't mention its name. You have a way to enforce the left one. Okay? You have a way to enforce the left one. When you learn how to enforce it, remember, it's always defaulted. How to enforce it, I'm going to teach now. I just want you to understand what happens. What is why we are teaching multiple inheritance. If we didn't have this problem, there was no need for it. Inheritance is inheritance. It doesn't matter if you have one parent or 50 of them. It doesn't make any difference. Okay? The syntax is the same. Accessing the properties of the parents, functionality of the parents, everything's the same. Okay? So, so, again, remember, when we are talking about multiple inheritance, there is nothing extraordinary about it. When you have virtuality, it is virtuality like the other ones. So, like, if I have an F stream, an F stream can be referred to as an IF stream, or it can be referred to as an OF stream. Why? Because IF stream and OF stream are the parents of F stream. So the virtuality, all the things that you have works exactly the same way. The only thing we need to understand is that which object instantiation I want to enforce. And that, as Wilson says, it's done with virtual inheritance. So virtual inheritance is a keyword that when you add it to your inheritance statement, it guarantees that the grandparent is created using a default constructor. So when you say virtual, no matter what, it's going to be, uh, no matter how you mention it, it's going to be the default. Okay? And also it guarantees that the grandparent will only get created. It's like a static thing that you are doing. The grandparent only will gener get generated once and it's going to be reused by all the other ones. You're not going to have many different instances out of it. Okay? Yes? True. Yeah. So yeah, so if you do that, then yeah, you, when you do virtual, you guarantee that the grandparent is one instance, not two. Gra that's why I, I, I don't know even if there is any other language that accepts multiple inheritance other than C++. No, it's not a terrible idea. It's just too complicated for our brains. That's all. It, it, creates, it creates lots of bugs. So it should be avoided if you can. But we have it in our uh, library structure. So it's not that it's a terrible idea. When you use it properly, it's an amazing idea. 
but because there are things that act uh, like two different things, right? If I create uh, a car that can also uh, float, I have a boat and I have a car. It is a multiple inheritance. That happens in real life all the time. Pardon me? It is. We are, we want it. That's that's why hashash. That's why that's why we call it object orientation. We are trying to simulate simulate the object that exists outside in nature. And if yes, go ahead. Is it possible to inherit from? Oh yeah, you can inherit from as many as you want. Yeah. So when I say diamond, if it, if it is if I do D three, D four, D five, D six, and the thing is that you have to specify the virtuality for every single one of them. So if one of them is virtual, the other one is not. So let's say in this diagram that I have, I set D1 as virtual and D2 is not virtual inheritance. Then what happens is that you're going to have one B that is defaulted and one B that is created by D2. If they are not both virtual, it's not going to reuse the same one. So virtuality is not that you can, if I make it virtual, I guarantee I have one. All of them has to be virtual, otherwise it won't be. Yeah. So, do we understand? <laughs> I want I want to f focus on the on the concept to understand what is the problem and how we try to fix it, and then I'm going to bring up the code. The code is going to take ten minutes to go through it. It's not a big deal. Yes. You have to speak loud. Or I'm going to come to you. Yes, go ahead. The right one. In D2, they both have different parents, right? They don't have different parents. The parents are identical. They are base. But because it's not virtual, they're going to create separate instances of base. So the class is the same. The objects are two objects of the same class. So the two bases that you see at right side, they are two instances. That's why I said this is an object diagram, not a class diagram. The right one is two objects of type base, one in D1, one in D2. The left one is one object of type base that if D1 says change my base, it's going to change the same thing at that if D2 says change my base is going to happen. So that's what I'm saying. From here, you can directly say base do something from G because base is unique. And here you say, I want bases print to happen, eh, something, right? You can do that. In here, if you say, I want bases print, it's going to say you are doing an ambiguous call. Which base? This one or that one? Got it? Are we good? Can, yes. So the, the right one. Yeah, if we don't v do anything virtual, it's the, it's the right one. Don't say green one because uh, people may not see colors. Yeah. then the two that are virtual are going to share the same. The one that is not the virtual is going to have its own instance. Again, virtual doesn't do magic. Virtual just says, and virtuality in inheritance only comes when you have more than two levels. If it's only one, it's just one. Nothing. It's exactly like the, the function thing that we say if there is no inheritance, virtuality doesn't come to play. It's the same thing over here. So when you make something virtual, if you're just instanti instantiating that, the virtuality doesn't matter. It doesn't do anything because that comes the case. But if, when it goes to the next level, that's when virtuality kicks in and makes the parent default. Okay? Which means a default constructor for the base should exist. If it doesn't exist, then it, it, this doesn't even happen. And you cannot even do that. Okay? It doesn't create... You, you know what does it? If you take care of... If you... Let's put it like this. When you, it's, the rule of uh, constructions happened uh, is exactly the same thing with the regular class, which means if you create a constructor, you're responsible for all of them. So if, if for the base you create a two-argument constructor and you don't create a default constructor, virtual inheritance is impossible for it because it doesn't have a base to get created. It doesn't have a default constructor to become a grandparent. So you have to have for it. Or you have to default it. You know what I mean? Equals to default. It means you're lazy to write it. You just want <clears throat> to. So.
so. All right, so let's clear all. Yeah? What did I do? A okay. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. I really uh, <clears throat> appreciate it. I was kind of wondering what happened. Okay, so that's that one. I, uh, so, <clears throat> this is the case that we have. That's my base, and that's my base 2. So I have two bases over here, right? And out of that base, I have a derived one that says public B2 and public B1. We good? And that's my derived one. And this is a very simple thing. There is nothing wrong with this. Uh, <clears throat> when I, uh, so just to show you, you know what, I just, just to make sure that it, we know what it does, when I pass a value to the derive, it adds 1 to it, passes it to B1, adds 2 to it, passes it to B2. Just for us to understand what happens. And, and B has the data, each one has to have the data of its own. So when I create an instance of B10, I can say C out, and I cast that one to uh, a B1, and I cast that one to a B2. Therefore, uh, it's going to print it that way, which means... The output of this program will do something like this. So when I create the D1, this is what happens. You see that? So I'm creating D over here. When I create D, uh, by creating D, B1 is created and uh, passed along. And therefore, let me just show you. So D over here shows what is the derived value. B1 and B2 shows exactly what the... Uh, so this is actually the constructor of D that is being called, and constructor of B1 and constructor of B2, and the values that are printed and so on and so forth. Okay, so these are casting essentially uh, this to uh, B1 and B2 and printing them out. So essentially when I'm printing... The value out because show is because show is virtual. No matter what I do, the latest version is called. Therefore, you know what I mean, right? It doesn't matter how uh, the class is being called uh, because it is a virtual function. It goes to the next one. Okay, it, it calls the latest version of it, and that's why you see that they are both printed exactly the same. And then, obviously, when it dies, it dies in reverse order which is uh, D, B, and so on and so forth. It goes like that. Anyways, are we okay with this? So this is a simple thing that we had, but we, the problem, so this is just multiple inheritance. This is what I was talking about. Now I have a base class. Base class has its own data. And when I, so it has a default constructor, first of all. And it sets the value to zero. And then it receives the data and shows what is the ba base data that is constructed and how it's getting destroyed and how it has a virtual thing that shows the base thingy, right? Are you okay with this? And my printout is exactly the same. So this time, I'm going to walk through it.
So when the derived is getting created, it comes to the constructor of B1 and B2, right? So what happens it, and I put B2, B1, so it goes first to the constructor of B1 and sets that one and the sequence with which these things are actually being passed to is uh, uh, the sequence in which the construction, the, the inheritance is happening. Okay, so uh, I think if you run this on matrix, you're going to get an error because the sequence of your constructors should match the data. So it should essentially be B1, B2, and data. But here is B2, B1 data. Okay? Um, the sequence of the initialization area should match the sequence of the attributes in your class. Anyways, so, <clears throat> but this is a, you know, Visual C++ is very forgiving. So where was I? Yes, yeah. so, so this happens and uh, V is now set to 20, so the 20 is passed through here, and uh, this one essentially is going to be 21. I pressed F11 by mistake. It went and uh, uh, did that one, so let's take a look at that. So as you see, base is created, and it shows what is the address. The reason that I'm putting that one over there, I want to know what is the address of data that the, that of the base that is being written into. That's why I have the second part of this thing over here printing the address of data because I want to see if the two bases are uh, overlapping or there are two different ones, okay? So that's created and comes out and goes to B2 now and B2 will create, as you see, the base with the value 32 in a different address. We're good with this? All right. So now this is the case of right-hand side, which I have two bases. Are we okay with this? And then the story continues. I'll come down over here. And one thing I say to my OOP244 students, and I'm going to tell it to you too. When you get to the walk, when you write a code, and you're going to go, wait a minute, huh? Which one's going to get called? That means you're going to get an error in compiling. If you cannot decide what is supposed to happen in, a, in, in multiple inheritance, you cannot fathom what's going to be the output, which function, which virtual function is going to be called, and so on and so forth, that's when the compiler is going to give you an error. Okay? So now, uh, so that's the, the constructor for the derive. And now I'm going to say call the virtual function. Now B1, it does the exact same thing. So it calls the uh, uh, B1 side of D and B2 side of D, which is essentially uh, the same thing. No difference, right? So it, it, uh, and as you see, you have two bases with two different addresses over there uh, and shows exactly uh, which one is what. Are we okay with this? All right. So So the multiple inheritance.cpp. Now the third one is the one that we are going to virtually inherit, which means it is the same same thing as the other one, as you see. I have the base, okay? <clears throat> but take a look at the inheritance. It says Class B1 virtually inherits public base. This virtual doesn't mean beep if you instantiate B1. If you instantiate B1, it doesn't mean anything. This virtual comes in action if you inherit B1 yet to another one. Virtuality always affects the next level of inheritance, not itself. Okay? 
and B2 is virtually inherited too. Because they are both virtually inherited, the request to create the base with V plus 2 doesn't mean anything when I create a derive. It's going to be defaulted anyways. Okay, let's take a look at it. And then now I come over here, I have to derive one, and uh, this is what we have, right? So, so let's uh, run it and see what happens. And uh, specifically, I instantiated B1 and B2 separately so you can see. Okay, let's put 20 and 30 over there, or 100 and 200, to make it completely different so we know what are we talking about in here. So I'll go to... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go to the derived one. Now take a look. The derived one tries to, because the derive is created, it tries to create B2. To create B2, it has to create the base. But when the base is created, V is zero. It's defaulted. It doesn't care how you requested it. And what it creates, what it actually creates, oh, did I press F? My, my apologies. <laughs> I pressed the wrong button. I'm going to go back again. <laughs> I, I ran the whole thing. I want to go step by step, and then poof, this came out. My apologies. I'm going to run it again. So I was here. I came up over here, and we said the first one is defaulted. Yes, there you go. So the first one is created, as you see, and that's the address of the data in it. Now I'm going to go to the second one. The second one is getting created, too. So it actually creates the rest, yada, yada, yada. And now... It goes to the base to create the next one. As you see over here, it's create the CB2 with 30, but no other base is created now. It didn't go even to the constructor of base at all because it was already created. It set it that way, and now it comes over here and creates the derived one. Okay? And, but take a look at B1 now. When I create the B1, with 100 over there, and I go pass by over here, it actually is 100. So it's not virtual anymore. It actually calls the one argument constructed while well, you have a question mark in your face. You're good? All right? So that's that. So what I'm saying is that virtuality only takes effect if you instantiate the grandchild. The parent's instantiation, the virtuality don't do anything for it. And the same story for the next one. So, same thing for the next one. And when I see out D, as you see, the base for both sides are identical. You see that 38, 938, 938. I printed the base in B1 and B2. But because it's the same, the outcome is the same and the addresses are the same too. And then it comes out and yada, yada, yada. But B1 and B2 are two up completely different things. The bases are completely different because they are not virtual. And that's the end of the story. Okay? That's all. There is nothing else to talk about. Now, one thing, one more thing actually. So this is uh, virtual inheritance. No, I'm getting busy. All right. <clears throat> now, the difference between the code that you see over here is that I removed the virtual from one of the bases. You see that? B1 is not doing virtual, but B2 is. So what happens is that when B2 is going to get created in the derived, it's going to be defaulted, and a separate base created for B1 with a regular base. So virtuality must be for all the, the parents. If one of them is missing, nothing's going to happen. Okay? So if I run this, you will see that. Oh, again, 100 and 200. Okay, 
So, what is going on? I didn't do anything this time. Sorry, I, seriously, I didn't do anything this time. It wasn't my fault. Anyways, so one, the, the first one will go over here. You will see that the first one actually gets created with zero. That's the one that has virtual. And the second one is the one that is not virtually inherited. So the second one is created with a different value. And that's a bad uh, virtual inheritance. And if I go to the first one and second one, then each one is created. Virtuality is completely off the picture. And uh, uh, virtual calls for both. As you see, there are different values. And B1 and B2 are individuals. And that press the case. So when you are to, to actually have a diamond created, you need to make everything virtual halfway through. That's a very easy walkthrough to write to see if you are actually following it or not. So careful for that for the final test okay if you, the ones that are if the if the grandchild is in here in instantiated and you see the parent has a virtual no matter how i try to create the base the base is always defaulted remember that that's the key about it that's the thing you need to remember grandchild if it's instantiated you have to see if the parent is virtually inherited from the grandparent if it's if it is virtual, you don't care how many virtuals you have. No matter what, how you create the, the, the base one, it is uh, defaulted. And if the base doesn't have a default constructor, then it won't even compile. You got, you got to say compiler. Okay? No, it, it, it can't because it doesn't have a default constructor. If you create... Again, the first rule of OOP244 applies. If you create any constructor, you're responsible for all of it. So if you create, if it doesn't have any constructor, it works. But if you create a regular constructor of any type, then you have to create the default one. Nothing happens magically. So the, I'm going to call this one bad virtual inheritance. That was it. I told you 20 minutes. I think I lied. It wasn't it was a little bit more. <laughs> but that was it. That's, that's, that's multiple inheritance. OK? Um, let's go for a break, come back, and finish off the uh, bitwise operators, too, so we are relaxed for the rest of the semester. We just study, OK? OK, so bitwise operators, and I'm going to teach exactly what is needed. Um, the um, spice and uh, you know, salt and pepper that I'm going to add to it. I'm going to do it on Monday if nobody has any question. If I, I'm going to say any questions. If somebody asks a question, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do the encryption thingy only if uh, no question comes up. Yes, Wilson. Shared between them. Yes. All right. All right. So let me save this. I'm going to pause the recording. Let's go for a break and come back. And then we're going to do bitwise operators. So before you start doing uh, um, bitwise operators, you have to always create a, a bit pattern for a nibble. You know what a nibble is, right? Half a byte, four bits. So that what you do is that you start from left and you go eight zero. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Then you go half. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, and then half of that. Two, one, two, one. Two, one, two, one, two, one, two, and then zero ones. Zero one, zero one, zero one, zero one, zero one. Now you have the bit patterns for a nibble. So essentially, if any type of uh, uh, ASCII code is uh, hexadecimal code is written for you, for example, if I have an A 
B, something like that. Then you simply put the patterns that you have in, th in front of A and B, and you have your bit pattern. So A is 1, 0, 1, 0, and B is, the, is 0, 1, 1, 1, so 1, 0, 1, 1. So that becomes the bit pattern of the byte for the hexadecimal AB. Are we okay with this? All right, and you know, you don't look at here, just look at there. Okay, <laughs> I've, never, I've never taught in reverse in my life. <laughs> but, 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 but you can see over here, right? So I have to write it over here to kind of <laughs> refresh myself. It's crazy. So, so AB, as I was mentioning, is 1010 zero, one, zero, and B is 1011. One, one. So this bit pattern is for that. Okay, are we okay with this? Okay, I can turn off the video. So you have to do that. You have to create. You have to create these before you do uh, bitwise operator stuff, so you can convert easily. Okay. Actually, you know what? Let me try something else. You know, people, I'm gonna do something, and you'll see that uh, I made a huge mistake. The camera of the huh. recorder actually does it properly. <laughs> so I did that for nothing. All right, but which is it's okay. <laughs> All right. They were smart, the people who actually did that. Uh, it's, it's interesting. Why this one is reverse, I don't know. Anyway, so. Yeah, so um, um, we, we want to do bitwise operators and understand what they are. So just uh, wipe out the stuff from multiple inheritance. We don't want that. So let's do something. First of all, we need to understand the bitwise operators and see what they do. So uh, very first thing that I'm going to do is to show you... Uh, uh, what bitwise operators do with respect to math, okay? So if I have an unsigned integer, okay, if I have an unsigned integer value, and the unsigned integer that I have goes uh, value 1, that's the bit pattern for it. We know it from there, right? And then when I multiply that by 2, it just shifts the bit 1 to left. It becomes 1, 0. And 1, 0 is 2, correct? You multiply by 2 again. Each multiply by 2 shifts the bit 1 to the other side. Are we okay with this? And the exact same thing happens when you divide by 2. So if I have the values like this, I say n is x80, then that one bit will come over here, right? If I divide it by 2, it's going to shift it to right unt until it reaches to 0, 0, 0, because I went a little too far. So this gone to garbage in uh, bit programmers who do uh, uh, programming, it goes to bit pocket. They say it's going to bit pocket. So go to garbage, it goes to bit pocket. Now, in assembly, you will see that. I forget about it, actually. But, but that's, that's what it is. Okay, so, so if I want to use this as advantage to see what the bit pattern of, uh, of, uh, 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 of a character is, I can use this feature and uh, uh, another... Um, aspect of uh, uh, bitwise operators that is and and or. We learned and and or. So if I have something like this, <clears throat> where is it? If I have something like this, and I'm going to draw that damn thing again. So <clears throat> give me two seconds <laughs> for it to go. So it's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, two, one, two, one, two. 
and zero one 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 and I have zero one two three four five six seven eight nine a b c d e f these are hexadecimal digits right so <clears throat> if i have for example the bit pattern uh say uh bit pattern four so i have x four uh a okay the pattern for x four a will be essentially uh, 4 will be 0, 1, 0, 0, right? And A will be 1, 0, 1, 0, like that, right? <clears throat> okay? Now, if I put something like X2, so the next one I'm going to do will be this. I'm going to put X2 over here, hexadecimal 2. So it's going to be 0, x2. If I do that, it's going to be 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, correct? Now, when you are dealing with regular operators that you have, when you are dealing with regular operators that you have, these regular operators of yours, um, regular logical operator of yours, when you say and, what does it mean? And essentially means to see if everything is zero or there is at least one of them one. It's a non-zero. So if I do uh, over here, like let's say I have this value in A and I have this value in B, okay? If I say A and B, the result of this one will be two non-zero values, which will be one, correct? That's what we have in C language. And if I, and if one of them was zero, which means this one, is, if B instead of that one was zero, zero, if that was B, now if I go A and B, then the result of this one would have been zero, because one of them is zero, one of them is not, right? Bitwise operators work like this. So if I have this one, say, as two, okay, so this is zero, X, two. And this is B. And this is A. Are we okay? If I say A and B, then this and means do a bitwise and between the bits of these two guys, which means 0 and 0 is 0. 1 and 1, 1. 0 and 0, 0. 1 and 0, 0. 0, 0, 0. 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, correct? If I do an A or B, the outcome will be 0 or 0, 0, 1 or 1, 1, 0 or 0, 1 or 0, 1, 0, 0, one zero. So this is how it happens. Do we understand this? Are we okay with this? <clears throat> now, going back to what I have written over here, take a look. Which bit of two is on? The second one, right? So when I OR these two, the value, because the one in front of that one is one, the value will be 1, everything else 0, correct? This is a non-zero value. I don't care what it is. If I make, instead of that one, if I make this one 1, what's going to happen? Everything's going to be 0. I'm going to have a 1 over here and everything 0, correct? That means the value is non-zero. If I have this one as 1, what happens? Then I have 0, and I have 0. So the value is 0. So I call this one <clears throat> a mask. What is a mask? So this is my mask. 
What is my mask? My mask is the bit pattern I want to check my data against. So what I will do, I will set that one, one by one to the values that I want, and I end them. If the result that is coming out is non-zero, it means that bit was one. If I want to find out, if I want, <laughs> Webinar's face is amazing. Okay, if I, <clears throat> okay. This is the bit pattern I have, right? If I want to see if the fourth bit is one, what should I create? I should create zero, zero, zero. I should set the fourth bit to one. Then I put the zero, 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 zero like that, and I end them. If the outcome is a non-zero value, I don't care what it is, that means the corresponding bit was one, correct? Because when you and them, this is going to be all zero, this is going to be one, this is going to be all zero. I have four zeros and a one, that's an eight, and I have zero, so it's x8, therefore the value is a non-zero value. If I want to see if the fifth bit of this one is one or not, what I'll do, I need to make the fifth bit one, and then do an AND, because all the bits over here have an opposing zero, everything's going to be zero, the result of the whole thing will be zero, therefore I know the fifth bit is zero. So how do I do that? <coughs> because I want to test my bit patterns. Oh, hello. Okay, so, all right. So we just found out that if I, for example, put over here n as 1 and I do multiply by 2, it's going to keep printing whatever I want to print, right? <clears throat> so let's do something like this. So I'm going to write something like void bit pattern. Okay? And I'm going to call that, I don't need that anymore. Ah. I need to tighten that screw. This is wobbly. Okay. So in here, I'm going to say unsigned character ch. I want to print the bit pattern of a, of, of a byte. So that's what I have. Are we okay now to this point? So now what I'm going to create over here is a mask. I want to create a mask. So I'm going to say unsigned character <coughs> equals to, I want to put one. What happens? It means character. That's one, correct? It means the rightmost one is one now, correct? Now, what do I need to do? I need to say four <coughs> size, oh, let's go int i set to zero, i less than size of ch multiply by eight, whatever it is. ch is a character, right? Size of character is one multiplied by eight, number of bits, correct? Uh, actually, let's ask, uh, um, okay, and I plus plus. So I'm doing something eight times, correct? Are we okay with this? Yeah. Now what I'm going to say, if CH and M, that's all. What does it mean? If the AND of CH and M together, if the CH of, if the CH of, uh, if, the, if the AND of CH and M together is a non-zero value, it means the first bit was one. Are we okay? All right. So in here, I'm going to say, See out one, right? Else, see out zero. Correct? Are we okay? Then after this is done, I have to move the one to left one side, correct? How do I do that? Multiply it by two, correct? So in here, I'm going to say uh, m is equal to m multiplied by 
2. And hopefully, that's going to show me the bit pattern for it. Are we OK? So let's do it and see if it works. So in here, I'm going to say uh, character ch uh, unsigned character uh, value is, uh, let's put 0x. What do I put that? It's an interesting thing. Let's put, uh, let's put mm, uh, a and c. I'm going to put a and c. I wanted to make that mistake and then show it was a mistake and get to it. Give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> Ruins all the fun out of the. <laughs> OK, so now in here, I'm going to say bit pattern. And I'm going to put V, OK? And uh, C out and L. So when I print this thing, as Iman ruined it for all of us, is this. So three years later. So it's going to show us this. Uh, when you, this, this, that mirror thingy was, was useful over here. So if I actually put AC, AC will be, AC will be 1010, zero, zero, and C is 1100, one, zero, zero, correct? And as you see, that's the exact opposite of that one. Because obviously, the first thing that I print is at right side, correct? Then I print the next one, so it prints the exact opposite of the pattern. Because the right one, it, the, the right bit, I cannot put it at right. The first one that I print is, is at left. Therefore, I need to start from 8. Correct? And by the way, it's a character. I don't need to size off, schmize off anything. <clears throat> That's for another thing. We don't need it for that one. So we do it like this. <clears throat> now, instead of m being equal to 1, I bring it to the leftmost one. If I want to make the leftmost one 1, I have to put 1, 0, 0, 0, and 0 everything, right? That's 8, 0. So I'm going to put 8, 0 in here. <coughs> OK? That's that. And now in here is going to be division. So now when I print, that is printed. OK? So it shows the bit pattern of the character. Now let's play with that character and look at different types of things that we can do. Now the, ver the very most important thing that you need to, to learn about this is this. If I say V uh, equals to v multiplied by 2, we know what happens, right? Oh, let's actually go to new line. So bit pattern shows that why I don't have to do it. C out. So when I multiply it by 2, this is what happens. You see, it's as if somebody, somebody push the thing to go on to the other side. You see that? I pushed it that side. And this side is filled with zero. You okay with that? You okay? So, but we have, <clears throat> but this is multiplication. What does multiplication do? It goes through what we call a, like the, uh, the coprocessor. The pro the, it doesn't happen in a, in a CPU. It goes to, a, to the math CPU and over there some crazy stuff are happening to make that thing happen. And it's a very expensive thing to do. We actually have something for that. We can actually push the sh push shift the bits to left and right. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what we call over here. You see that insertion operator? That's the thing that is overloaded. This is actually left shift. This, is, this comes from C. It's called left shift. So I can say, Instead of doing this, I can say v is equal to v shifted once to left. And it's the same thing. <laughs> so that thing that you see that you use in C++ insertion operator, and I always say left shift, right shift, it is actually left shift. If I want to shift something two times to left, this is what I do. There you go. Now it's shifted two times to left. So it actually shifts the bits inside a thing to left and right. That's what it's made for in C language. It had nothing to do with C++. They overloaded it and made it that way. 
and ruined our lives. Okay, so that so for th because of this, I wouldn't actually do this anymore. Divided by two, I'm gonna go like a human being. <laughs> I want to shift it to left or right. Oh, sorry, actually, it's a shift to right. Right. So essentially, I'm putting the red, and I'm gonna shift it to right. Yes. No, it's, it's, it is, that's what I wanted to say. If you want to multiply something by two, if you want to multiply something by two, left shift it to one. That's hundreds of thousands of times faster. That's a lie. That's much more faster than multiplication because multiplication does math for you. This one literally tells to CPU, it's like, move the shifts to left. There is no loop happening. It is within the CPU circuits to do that. It's literally those flip-flops over there go switch one left. So it's a very extremely fast thing to do. People who do programming for graphics board and want to multiply by four, divide by, they shift twice to left and right because that's much faster than actually doing multiplication and division. Of course, it doesn't for work for floating point values, only integers. Only, shush, only integer, because because a, a floating point division is a completely different ball game. Okay, all right. Yes, yeah. Okay. Why do we need bit shift? Okay. <clears throat> This is called low-level programming, OK? Low-level programming. Now I'm going to show you something else that we, we could do that we have never known that we could do. We have something called exclusive OR. You have OR and AND. But there is another thing called exclusive OR. You know what an exclusive OR is? In exclusive OR, it means different is good, same is bad. That's exclusive OR. It means two ones is zero in an exclusive OR. It's and it's magic. Because anything to be exclusive OR to the same value gets its own value back. Let me show you. <clears throat> so first of all, why are we learning bit shifting? It, it's like you just put a dagger in my heart now. <laughs> like that, because you can, you can, you can play with all basics of computer design and it's yeah so the very first example encryption is done with shifting so how does encryption, like uh, that's very simple encryption, that, that the most simple encryption I was explaining at the beginning of the class. Remember I told you shifting? So what happened when I said shifting, it wasn't an array. When I actually f put four bytes over there, this is one integer with 32 bits. You divide it by two, you do a circular shift, which means you push it out, but you keep what you're pushing out. If it's a one, you hold it somewhere. If it's a zero, you hold it somewhere. First, you shift everything right, and then you put that value, put it back over here. And then you do it, so you do a shift, circular shift like this, and then you do a circular shift like this, okay? So keep that in mind. So now let's put some values over here for things and see what happens. So now we know what left shifting and right shifting is. So <coughs> this, uh, this is not C in. Okay. <laughs> this is right shift. Okay. Shifting bits in CH. So what I could do instead of bit pattern, I could actually make it, a, instead of a character, I could make it an integer and do the exact same thing. So make it, so for an integer, you have to, <clears throat> let me write the bit pattern for an integer too. 
void bit pattern unsigned int unsigned int uh, uh, mm, i or v value whatever it is okay now I want to make the left one now you said what shifting is good for I want to make the left one one how do I do that how do I know what is the size of an integer it could be four it could be eight how do I set the left one okay now a question if I have a one over here how many times I have to shift it so it goes to the leftmost place in a in a in a uh, in a byte if you do eight times, you're, you're going to seven. seven, right? So si number of bits minus one, right? So now I can, I can create. So I'm going to copy the exact same thing in here. So this mask of mine is an unsigned int now. And I'm going to say it will be set to one. Now I want to move that one left how many times? So I'm going to say, how many times? It's an integer. Integer. An integer is 4 bytes or 8 bytes. So I don't know how many times I have to, sh I have to shift it to left. So this, I'm going to say, m is equal to m left shift. How many times? Size of int multiply by 8 minus 1. Now I guarantee that the left one is one. That's the first usage for shifting. Why do I like when you want to deal with bits? That's how you. That's how you do it. Now the left one is there. Now you can actually do it the exact same way. So you can say v and that one, and this one is going to be the. Ex is, it's going to be a size of int multiplied by eight. Okay. And now that's going to show a bit pattern for, a, for, a, for an integer if you want, okay? Or if you want to have a short integer, then you put the short integer and it goes 16 bits, whatever, okay? Yes? Yeah, depending on what your platform is. If you have a 64-bit operating system and a 64-bit, uh, if you set your Visual Studio to be 64-bit on a 64-bit machine, you're going to have it, uh, an integer to be 8 bytes. And see that that's the thing. Integer is a tricky thing. It I don't know if if, if I, because uh, I'm a dinosaur when it comes to this programming stuff. Uh, 20, 30 years of this thing. So, but I remember that int was always a tricky thing because they said int is the size of integer in your platform. Long is always a long integer. Short int is always a short integer. Int is the one that because right now when you do long integer that's four bytes, right? But it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be eight bytes. So that's what I'm saying. It from in from from the thing that you have, um, it changes. So all these values changes, and you don't know exactly which one has what value. Anyway, so <clears throat> anyway, so that's that's that. Let's uh, do some testing over here. So I'm gonna have. Uh, so I'm gonna say over here unsigned character uh, W, and I'm going to set that one to 0. Point, uh, x. I don't know, I'll put uh, 3, 4, whatever that, th that's going to be it. Yes? Holy shmoney, have a good day, I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. <laughs> let's go, let's go, let's go.